The sewing machine was really the first machine of any sort to enter the home. When it first appeared in the 1850s, it was regarded as the miracle of its age. To the people of the time, it must have seemed almost inconceivable that a machine could do such a fiddly and complicated action as sewing that I find quite difficult enough with both hands and a lot of concentration. Personally, I still find sewing machines quite magical, how effortlessly they work, producing such perfect stitches and without hardly ever tangling up. To make a machine that directly imitated hand sewing would be very difficult. The real secret of machine sewing has been to find a completely different sort of stitch that's more suitable. The first clues came from a sort of embroidery decoration popular in the 18th century. This used the hook needle and formed a so-called chain stitch. The needle never needs to go right through the fabric so it can be firmly fixed to part of a machine at the top. The first attempts at mechanical sewing imitated this embroidery stitch. The first patent was granted to Thomas Saint, an English cabinet maker, in 1790. When a model was made from his drawings a hundred years later, it had to be extensively modified before it would work so it's doubtful whether Saint ever actually built one. The first person to build a sewing machine and put it to any practical use was a French tailor called Thimonier. After years of failure, he finally patented a machine in 1830. By 1841, he had 80 machines stitching army clothing in a Paris factory. An angry crowd of tailors, fearing that the invention would rob them of their livelihood, then broke into the factory and destroyed the machines. Timonier was ruined and eventually died penniless. This is a model of Thimonier's machine in the Science Museum, which exactly imitates the hand embroidery stitch. We're having some trouble in uh, making it stitch, but uh, we have got to make, made it do a few stitches. Put it off, I think. Back again. Back again. We haven't managed to make it stitch very neatly. But even if the machine was properly set up, chain stitch still has the disadvantage that it's very easily pulled apart. Unknown to Thimonier, other inventors were experimenting with a different sort of stitch, lock stitch, using two separate reels of cotton. The machines were more complicated, but the stitches they produced were neater, and uh, they didn't pull apart so easily. The secret of these machines was really the brilliant shape of the needle itself. We've made a giant one here, and you can see the eye is in the pointed end of the needle, and it has a groove all the way up one side that the thread can slip through. Well, with the real needle, if I push it through a bit of uh, cotton and pull it out again, it automatically leaves a loop underneath. And all the machine needs to form a stitch is to pass the second reel of cotton through the loop. The first lock stitch machine was built in America by an inventor called Walter Hunt in about 1833. It didn't work very well, so he lost interest and didn't even bother to patent it. Elias Howe patented an improved machine in 1845, and despite an initial lack of interest, this then acted as a catalyst to other American inventors and within 10 years, all the major elements of a modern sewing machine had been introduced. I'm going to try and demonstrate these with this human sewing machine, stitching together two sheets of expanded polystyrene. The needle goes through the material, 
The bottom bobbin is pushed through the loop, the needle comes out and the stitch is pulled tight, and the material is pulled forward. Every lock stitch machine has these four movements. Pushing through the needle, passing the loop round the bobbin, pulling the stitch tight and moving the material forward. The movements are all connected to the motor by a series of ingenious mechanical linkages. First, the linkage to the needle itself. This is often just a crank the simplest way to get an up and down motion from a rotation. Next, the device that pulls the stitch tight. This is basically an arm that flies up at the right moment, just as Ellie's was doing. But Ellie also had to grip the thread with her other hand to stop the thread being pulled from the reel instead of through the stitch. So on a sewing machine, there's a sort of friction pulley between the cotton reel and the arm. It's getting the thread to pass cleanly through these two things before the needle that always makes threading up a machine so elaborate. The action of the arm itself is surprisingly simple. Just two levers fixed to the needle mechanism. It's wonderful what a vast range of movements can be derived from simple cranks and levers. These are some collecting boxes I made for the Science Museum. They're actually portraits of people who work here. The idea was to show exactly what a donation would fund, so a pound makes them work for ten times as long as 10p. This is the curator. He takes the pipe out of his mouth and then scratches his head. If you look inside, you can see the arm is a simple crank connected to a geared motor. Back to the sewing machine. The next action is passing the thread loop round the bobbin. This is what Ian was doing in the human sewing machine. To me, this is the most magical part, how it manages to do it without tangling up. On a real machine, instead of passing the bobbin through the loop, the bobbin stays still and a sort of rotating hook pulls the loop so it's large enough to pass right over the bobbin. With the bobbin back in place, all you can actually see is the red thread slipping round the outside. The last movement, pulling the cloth forward for the next stitch, is technically called a four-motion feed because the toothed metal bit moves forward, down, backwards and up again. It does this with these two off-centre rings on the drive shaft. The one on the right pulls the claw backwards and forwards, the other one makes it go up and down. So both combined give the four motions. This completes the basic mechanism all four movements connected to a single drive shaft. This is actually a toy made in Germany about 1893. It's called the Nuremberg Lady or Nuremberg Princess. It's patented. The cotton goes in here, that's the bobbin, comes through a tensioning system, comes across to here, the needle would have been held in her hand see your head nods. Although it is a toy, it has all the mechanical characteristics of an ordinary sewing machine. I've been collecting sewing machines for about 15 years and about three years ago a few of us got together and decided to form a society to pass on information and share information and find out what was going on and it is now an international sewing machine collector society which we show on to ISMAX 
and we have members all through the world, America, Australia, Hong Kong, all throughout Europe. And uh, I just brought along one or two of my machines to show the very different types that are available. These come, that comes from France, Germany, those are America, this is Glasgow, and that one's from Coventry, an English-made machine. And every one is slightly different the way it developed. Well, a very unusual machine is uh, this little one here. Unlike the rest of the machines, this isn't painted or brightly coloured. It's nickel-plated, looking a bit like a giant stapler. Very, very nice noise, a bit like a puffer train. Now, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why this machine should have hands. No reason apart from being pretty. Why somebody should do it, I don't know. It was made in Coventry by a man called Starley, and his trademark was Lady Godiva on a horse. The lion, the beast. Uh, it was made by a Glasgow company called Kimball and Morton about 1863-ish. As a sewing machine, it's quite ordinary. It's just a shuttle mechanism. It's just unusual because of its shape. Now, this is a French machine. It's called La Populaire, and it's certainly a very popular machine among collectors. Although it's called... Um, it works on an average system. We always call it a pusher. And it is one of the very few to use this unusual push-start mechanism. But we've seen all these very different looking, very complicated, very simple mechanism machines. But one of the simplest, one of the prettiest, one of the most popular, and probably, in my opinion, one of the best. The Wilcots and Gibbs. The early machines were all beautifully decorated. I think this was because the sewing machine was the first machine to enter the home. At the time, all other machines were industrial. Lavish decoration was an attempt to make them look more domesticated. At first, the different manufacturers' machines had very distinct characteristics. But by the 20th century, they'd all started looking more and more alike. This was partly due to the commercial dominance of one particular manufacturer. Oh, John, I'm so discouraged. How can I ask anybody to this house the way the furniture looks? Well, it is pretty awful. But I don't suppose we could buy much with our money. Not unless a miracle happens. Ah, uh, there's the miracle. Hurry, 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 hurry. Answer that doorbell. That's the first time I ever saw a miracle in a two-pant suit. But it's the Singer Man. He'll send her to the nearest Singer Sewing Center, and the Miracle Man turns her over to that Miracle Woman, the sewing teacher, to you. Just a few simple lessons on the sewing machine, and her house will look so attractive, they'll probably sell it at a profit. Now, take a look at the finished room with the rest of the girls she's invited over. You don't mean to tell me these draperies, curtains, and slip covers yourself. How did you ever make them so perfectly? It's a grand color scheme. They must have cost a pretty penny. Only $18.31. What? Well, I wish I could sew like that. But you can, Martha. What's that? The address of the nearest Singer Sewing Center. Get it? The company was founded by a man called Isaac Merritt Singer. Although Singer was trained as a mechanic, his real love was the theatre. Julie, I've always loved you, honey. Can you ever forgive me? Oh, this is Whoa. so sudden. Oh, Homer. In 1839, he managed to sell a design for a mechanical excavator for $2,000. Power gets to the bucket, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll buy it. And with the money, he set up his own theatre company called the Merit Players. Oh, I'm rich. I'm rich. Now I can start my theatre company. Sting him up. Oh, oh no. God damn hell, I will. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. 
see, oh. honey, I told you I'd save you. Oh, Julie. My hero. Singer's Theatre Company went bankrupt after a few years. Then, in 1851, he came across an early, unreliable sewing machine. I could do better than this. He built his prototype in only 11 days and then went into production. Singer's machine wasn't particularly original, but he was brilliant at selling it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this machine sewing before your very eyes. Here is your trousers, Isaac. Proves they're going to work. Yep. In partnership with a sober lawyer called Clark, he started the first ever hire purchase scheme. By 1867, Singer was a very rich man, with a total of 18 children from a variety of wives and mistresses. But because the machines were being sold to respectable homes, Clark then persuaded Singer to leave the country. It's a one-way ticket. Oh. You gotta leave town. No? Singer eventually settled in Torquay, where he died in 1875, leaving a total of 24 children. <laughs> From the earliest days of the sewing machine, attempts were made to find a better way of powering it than just turning a handle. In America, the treadle caught on immediately, because it was a great advantage having both hands free to control the cloth. But in Britain, it was regarded with great suspicion for many years. It was generally thought to be unladylike and rather harmful for the ankles. Attempts were made to power the machines by water wheels, giant clockwork motors and steam, but all were inconvenient. The first electric machines appeared in the 1920s. At first the motor was a separate lump bolted on. Only very gradually did it become integrated in the body of the machine. The motor itself is connected by a drive belt. This belt used to be rubber or leather, but on modern machines, um, there's a synthetic toothed belt, which has the big advantage that it doesn't slip. They've now replaced belts, gears and chains on many machines, like photocopiers. They're quieter, easier to set up and don't need oiling. A couple of years ago, I made this trick suitcase for a conjurer clown. Uh, for a stage show. Um, it does several tricks, about eight of them in all, but uh, the relevant ones today are the fact it can walk off stage entirely of its own accord. Whereupon it can stop and then um, it can fall over. Um, the drive mechanism has worked entirely on uh, tooth belts. I use them quite a bit. Um, two of the tooth belts act as like caterpillar tracks and the third one is the drive. I'll show you it working. There are limitations to the movements you can get out of simple cranks and levers. So a lot of sewing machines also use cams. This machine's actually a cobbler's machine used for sewing leather. The cams can create a much wider range of movements using irregularly shaped slots and discs like this one. Just like cranks and levers, these have all sorts of uses and I quite often use them myself. This is the warder in the science museum. I made the warder with a simple crank at first, but then he just moved his head evenly from side to side. And it didn't look at all realistic, it looked entirely mechanical. So I swapped it for a cam, and then it gave it its sort of jerky motion, and he actually looked as if he was looking around. And looking down at his watch was the same. Instead of a continuous down and up movement, it needed to be down, pause and up. 
so I used another cam. This is a doctor I made who writes out illegible prescriptions. Cams can be used for really complicated movements. Most modern sewing machines can do a wide variety of fancy stitches. They look a lot more complicated, but there's only one basic extra movement, and that's moving the needle from side to side. And by combining sideways needle movements with uh, variable cloth feed movements, all sorts of fancy stitches become possible. Each stitch has a different cam. If I change to a different stitch, the cam follower moves, and you can see it moving to a different rhythm. This is one of the latest electronic machines. The idea behind it is really quite simple. Instead of using cams to vary the needle and the cloth movement, it uses these devices called stepper motors. Each pulse of electricity I send it makes it go round one step. And I can use it to um, move a lever in just the same way as a cam. I'll try and imitate it over here. Uh, By programming a microprocessor to produce a rapid sequence of pulses to control the stepper motor, uh, the movements of the needle can be very accurately controlled. I th think you can see the stepper motor moving the needle in uh, this machine. The stepper motor is fixed to a cog which moves the needle in small steps. This machine is a faff. Today, Singer has lost its market dominance, and German and Swiss manufacturers now produce the most advanced machines. But I'm not convinced that all the electronics is really a good idea in the sewing machine. However good the design, there's still an awful lot more to go wrong than in a basic machine. And I'm not sure that all the fancy stitches are really worthwhile. The service engineers I've talked to say that uh, a lot of people never use them. With the old mechanical machines that used to last anything up to a hundred years, the lack of obsolescence was quite a problem for the manufacturers. Singer used to have a policy of breaking up any machines taken in part exchange to reduce the supply of second-hand ones. I suspect all the complexity of the fancy stitches has added quite a convenient degree of obsolescence. But anyway, the golden age of the domestic sewing machine is perhaps already past. Make me a gown that is a perfect yes. fit, like yes. the one you made for Lady yes. Duck. When it first appeared, there were no clothes shops anywhere. You either made your own... Oh, the tickles. ...or, if rich enough, got a tailor to do it. It will be a couple of weeks, ma'am. Even a generation ago, most families made some of their own clothes. But the sewing machine, besides speeding up home sewing, also made the off-the-peg clothing industry economically successful. Home dressmaking is today just a minority hobby, and the home sewing machine has lost its central importance. Mm, bit tight. The old machines were built to last a lifetime. Despite my doubts about the latest ones, they have to some extent carried on this tradition, and mechanically they're still surprisingly well made. I think that to make the machines fast, quiet and reliable, they have to be quite heavy and rigid, and they also have to be very precisely made. And it's really these qualities that make them such wonderfully satisfying machines.